If you're a regular Geek's Guide to the Galaxy listener, please rate and review us on iTunes or using the podcast app on your phone. We just passed 1,000 five-star ratings. So huge thanks to everyone who's taken the time to rate and review us. You are now my 1,000 favorite people. And so I want to give a special thank you to Chris himself, 22, who just gave us this five-star review. Rekindled my love of fantasy. As a kid, I loved fantasy literature. But as I grew up, I lost touch with the people I shared my geekiness with and my love of the genre. Finding this podcast has single-handedly made me love fantasy again. As a Brit, I have found many recommendations for American books that I never would have heard of. And Dave's discussions with this great panelist have made me feel part of a fantasy community again. Thanks, Geeks Guide. You have made my life better. So big thanks again to Chris himself, 22, for that great review. All right, so now let's get to our show. Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 489 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Our guest today is John Peterson. He's the author of the books Playing at the World and The Elusive Shift, and co-author of the book Dungeons & Dragons, Art and Arcana, all of which deal with the history of Dungeons & Dragons. He's also the co-author of the Dungeons & Dragons-themed cookbook Heroes Feast. And we'll be speaking with him today about his new book Game Wizards, The Epic Battle for Dungeons & Dragons, about the long-running feud between Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson over who should be considered the true creator of Dungeons & Dragons. And we've previously discussed the history of Dungeons & Dragons back in episodes 49, 105, 170, 185, 331, and 446. So definitely check those out if you miss them. And now here's our interview with John Peterson. All right, so we're here with John Peterson. Welcome to the show. It is my pleasure to be back on the show. Uh, always, always good to talk to you, David. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay, and so your new book is called Game Wizards. So how'd this book come about? Well, way back in 2014, I wrote an article that was called The Ambush at Sheridan Springs. And this was right after my first book, Playing at the World, had come out. And I'd gotten super interested in like the later history of TSR, and in particular, just mechanically, like how Gary Gygax got ousted from the company. Like, how did it work? Like, who had what shares? Like him versus the Bloom Brothers versus Lorraine Williams. And like, you know, I I figured that there was a story in that that was worth telling if we could just kind of get access to the data for it. And so I mined a lot of court documents and I put out this article and I, uh, a lot of people liked it uh, when it came out. And I was like, you know, I should, I should keep working on this, right? Like I should kind of fill in the story, like the corporate side of the story of D&D. And so what is it? It's only seven years later. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I I now have a book just about that. And so you've been working on this continuously for the past seven years on this general TSR research project. And when I say continuously, I mean, I was doing a lot of other things at the same time. And it was really just kind of when, you know, when I managed to find more stuff, when a lot of former TSR employee stuff went on eBay, for example, that I could buy, and then I'd get a lot more, you know, kind of internal documents, or when some someone said, great, you can come to my house and scan anything you want from my stuff. Hmm. Um, so, you know, it, it kind of came together piecemeal, like, you know, a little bit at a time, but you know, ultimately, I think I managed to find enough sources that uh, at least most of the questions I thought were interesting questions, um, I can at least shed some light on. A lot don't have definitive answers, but I think I can at least um, paint enough of a picture to deepen our confusion. <laughs> so when you're talking about the the stuff that went up on eBay or the stuff that was in people's houses and stuff, is, were there any key documents, sort of Rosetta Stone sort of things that, that came out? I mean, definitely having access to things like, for example, TSR's audited financials. This is a big one where, you know, because TSR, when they would talk to the press, um, you know, they would say all kinds of things right, about how much money they were making, how much profit they were making. And they didn't always agree with themselves, you know, from like year to year on what the particular take for a year was. So, I mean, that'd be a good example, having access to things like a professional auditing firm came in and said, this is how much money TSR made. This is how much profit they did or didn't make. Um, you know, things like that, that just give you anchors, right? That you can say, okay, the narrative has to work in a way that they were doing this well then, and then not so well <laughs> at this time. And you know, sim- similar things for like uh, unit sales, um, 
you know, anything that was internal correspondence that shed light on um, the problems, right? I mean, and, and by the time we get to the mid 1980s, there were a lot of problems. <laughs> <laughs> anything that can just kind of let us see um, what those problems were. And to get down to, okay, everyone knows there was nepotism in the Bloom family. It's something Gary Gygax complained about endlessly. Can we make that concrete? Can we find like what that actually was? Um, you know, th these are the kinds of things that I went after that uh, fortunately I was able to find some sources that I think give us a much better picture of. Yeah, I guess just for people who might not know this story at all, let me just hmm. very quickly sum up the basic history here. So you had these two guys, Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson, and they were both very serious hobby war gamers and mm -hmm. were both unemployed and created this game together, Dungeons and Dragons, which they were expecting to maybe make at most $300 off of <laughs> right. and ended, it ended up making millions. And then they spent about 10 years in this long public relations and legal battle over who deserved the credit and the money uh, and, and the control over the game. And in the end, this woman, this businesswoman, Lorraine Williams, swoops in and kind of uh, outmaneuvers Gary Gygax and takes control of Dungeons and Dragons for herself. Is that a pretty good three sentence Pretty good. Pretty good. The... The, the, the cliff notes are now available uh, <laughs> for anybody who would rather uh, rather read those than, than the book. Yeah, no, that, that's a, a good statement of it. I mean, it was coming from, as you said, something that wasn't really like a company originally, but just just a hobby. Um, something nobody expected could ever make any money. Um, the, you know, Gygax and Arneson had previously worked on these war games that, you know, maybe could bring in like $20 a month of royalties, right, from a publisher. And they didn't really have much bigger expectations for D&D. &D. But when it suddenly took off, then, yeah, everyone was scrambling to figure out, okay, like we did something right. So how do we hold on to it? And how do I make sure I get my part of whatever this was? And this this did lead to a very long and uh, acrimonious battle that, as you said, um, kind of as it started to wrap up, that battle did. Other problems within TSR with Gygax's other business partners, the Blooms, and then just the company's inability to make a profit at a time that they were making almost $30 million a year. Um, this created an opportunity that, you know, I think Lorraine Williams saw in TSR a business that could be profitable. Um, there was no reason other than the fact the company had overextended why it wasn't. And she made her move and uh, took control of the company. So you say in the book that um, that the stories that the creators told, Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson, had led many people, including yourself, on a wild goose on wild goose chases. So, what were mm -hmm. some of those wild goose chases? I mean, um, this you know, I, I I hate to try to put it like I think they misrepresented the situation. I think in a legal battle like this. People say all kinds of things, right? I mean, when I was talking about the nepotism, for example, this is a good one for Gary Gygax. You know, Gary would say in an interview in 1992 that, you know, at the time the TSR had overextended, you know, the there were 600 people on staff and 100 of them were related by blood or marriage to the Blooms, right? And if we, we take statements like that at face value, um, we're missing something because TSR never had that many people and certainly not that many people that are related to the Blooms on staff, right? But if you if you take something that somebody said later, remembering this conflict after, you know, a lot of years and, and bitterness had passed, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not going to be as reliable as the in, in internal documents that show, okay, here's our entire corporate directory. Here's how many people are working <laughs> here at this time. And, you know, kind of go go with that instead. And it wasn't unique to Gygax. I mean, you know, Arneson himself, you know, he, he was more cagey, I think, with the statements. But I mean, you know, he certainly um, had a, a complicated relationship with how D&D &D was developed and how he came to work at TSR in terms of what work he, he did at the time and kind of what his responsibilities were. And the ways that he's mis misrepresented, misrepresented that ultimately in the long term, I think, haven't, haven't been helpful either. So um if you just kind of go by what the recollections and the the spin bluntly that people put around this back when there was like money at stake and this is the issue is because there was so much money at stake there was a lot of incentive to spin um you know then i think you can end up with a, a pretty distorted picture of what actually happened 
On the subject of the nepotism, I just want to read this thing that I thought was hilarious. But this is the Blooms were sort of high ranking executives, co-owners of, of the company TSR that, that was publishing Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, but so in the employee newsletter at one point, it says, Brian's wife, Vicky, who used to work for Doug, her husband's brother, now works for Steve, her husband's other brother's wife's sister's husband. <laughs> just to give you an idea because there were a lot i mean there were there were there, there weren't 100 but there were like 20 or something right yeah um, like 20 i mean it's funny in the, in the wall street journal uh in 1983 you know when this is after uh jake jacket had who was then editor of dragon had quit they were talking to him about nepotism and you know he said that there were at least 20 bloom family members on staff guy gax responded no no it was only 10 again in this you know <laughs> contrast that with his later statement that it's that there were 100 right um you know certainly there, there were quite a few and it was an issue i mean and it was some, certainly something that infuriated uh the just rank and file staffers at tsr um especially as there were a couple of high profile incidents where members of the bloom family maybe weren't making the best business decisions for TSR and um, and yet, you know, they really face no consequences for that. Yeah. And, and I mean, but it, Gygax did do some self mythologizing. It seems like, I don't know if it was, um, you know, like he was intentionally misleading people or he just kind of like came to misremember what had happened exactly. But I mean, you know, he told a lot of people that he had quit his job as an insurance underwriter to boldly strike out right. as a game designer when it seems the truth is more like he got fired for spending too much time working on games at work. Yeah. Um, yeah. He definitely didn't like the job at that point. And, you know, I mean, so you can, you can kind of argue is, you know, did, did he self-sabotage right to a point where they, they had to fire him basically. It might be something like that, but you, you do, you build up these, these um, especially corporate origin myths, right? It's very important. Um, that a lot of companies have their their story about the scrappy inventors who risked everything on an impossible dream, you know, the, you know, jobs in Wozniak in the garage or, you know, for there's comparable things for Zuck and the, the Winklevi, right? Like, <laughs> um, but, you know, inevitably these things are part of just corporate marketing. I mean, and so it's not even it's misrepresentation. It's like this is what you put in slicks that go out that create a human interest story that will be picked up by the media in the right way. Um, it's it's just part of the the evil of doing business that like you know these heroic inventor myths like this end up taking shape. Mm -hmm. I mean, you also have this thing where um, Guy Gax, after he got forced out of TSR, he sort of made it sound like things were going fine until he was sort of stabbed in the back. And he was definitely stabbed in the back, but things were definitely mm. not going fine uh, before no. that happened. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he he kind of has long presented this in, in very late interviews, interviews from the 2000s, as something where he had no idea that the company, you know, was no longer profitable, that the Blooms had, you know, behind his back spent all this money. Um, and it wasn't until like the fall of 1984 when after he'd been in Hollywood, he came back and suddenly discovered that like all this stuff was happening. And, you know, he was chairman of the board that entire time. He was playing, spending plenty of time in Lake Geneva, probably at least a quarter of his time there. And, you know, more, more importantly, I mean, in 1983, he was removed as CEO of TSR Hobbies because it had just taken a loss, right? And they had to restructure the company. And like they, you know, owed all this money to the bank and the bank demanded a 30% staff reduction. Like this, this happened while he was president. <laughs> it's not like he didn't like know this a year before. But but I think it, it does, it, you know, and the retrospective of this is things had started to go out of control in the year before that, leading up to that. As of 1982, pretty much there was no discipline to impose on the mess that was TSR. And like, so when you get down to who was really to blame, um, was it that the Blooms were overextending? Was it that Gygax was spending much too much time working on Hollywood stuff already before then? And so he wasn't really kind of minding what was going on. Um, it's a bit harder to say, but, but definitely it's unhelpful that the later accounts of this are all, well, I had no idea. And this was there, there's a Wall Street Journal article about this happening <laughs> with like a picture of Guy Gax that has a headline that talks about like poor management at the company. And like, you know, I, I don't think he was ignorant of that at the time. Yeah. I mean, so this is, I think, the sixth book about the history of Dungeons and Dragons that I've read. So I thought I had a pretty good handle on it. But um, this this book really gave me a much different picture than I had had before and a much sort of much more negative picture of Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson. Is that something you were really conscious of? 
I mean, um, yeah, I mean, there's a sense in which I didn't really want to tell a negative story and, you know, um, you know, I think it serves a purpose to tell this, which is it helps you understand why there were so many negative things bluntly that were said about this in later years. And, you know, it's, if there's a lesson for me, for people who study D and D history from this, it's like, take those negative stories with a grain, grain of salt, right. When it comes to, especially the way that Gygax and Arneson saw each other. But I mean, there's another sense in which I've, I've written a lot about the joy of this game, right. The incredible um, creative explosion that this game unlocked. And, you know, this, this is um, me kind of quarantining in one book, the bad stuff, like, okay, but you, when you really just look at it as a business and legal story, it's a train wreck. It just is. Um, these people did not come into this with the necessary experience in business or the necessary kind of plans for a business for this to be successful beyond the hobby realm. And, you know, I, I think you need to get that to understand, you know, why it was that Gary ended up out of the company, why it was that, you know, Arneson's lawsuits kind of went the way they did. And, um, you know, it's, it's not fun to write something that, that is ultimately pretty negative. I, I agree. Um, but at the same time, I think it's it's necessary that if you don't get kind of the nuance of these business and legal circumstances, there's a there are just causes and effects that you're not going to understand without it. I mean, is all this stuff, is this kind of old news to you at this point after seven years or were you still like, like, have you sort of processed it all at, at this point or were you still like in the last year or two still like coming across things where you're like, oh, my God, not not another, not another thing? No, I mean, I, I think for me, this was probably done in 2018 or so. I mean, most of what's happened since then is actually like narrowing it down, reducing it. From <laughs> I, I tend to write a lot. And so getting this into um, a more self-contained chunk was what most of the tail end of the process was for me. That much said, it's it's not like this is done. Like, I mean, it, it may seem like the book is detailed. It doesn't feel detailed to me. It feels like there are just so many still like gaps and ambiguities and things I don't understand. And this, I hope, creates a relatively stable and coherent framework. But the study of this stuff for me is still in its infancy. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to the question of, you know, who should get credit for Dungeons and Dragons, Gary Gygax or Dave Arnes, and you quote this fanzine where they say, Arneson may feel if there is to be any single name associated with FRP gaming, it should be not Gygax, but Arneson. In this, he would have some justification. After all, Blackmore was the first reasonable approximation of a modern D&D campaign. But Gary Gygax is the man who pushed D&D into the marketplace. And for that, he deserves all our thanks. Do you consider that? And you said you, you think that's a pretty balanced view or would you dispute that at all? Yeah, I think it is balanced in the sense, I mean, I, I read that as saying that they were co-creators, which has always been my position. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think that this is attributable to, you know, any specific person. And really, I mean, I, I'd go even more broadly and say, I mean, I think it takes a village, right, to make these things. And they're all drawing on all these different sources and experiences and all these inputs that went into it, whether that's Brownsteins, whether that's, you know, like all, all these other phenomena that were kind of going on um, in the time leading up to D&D. &D. So it's never um, the right thing to kind of break down the invention of something with this kind of cultural significance to any single individual. Um, it's always going to be part of a uh, you know, a, a broader process, um, a process that, you know, they're going to be particular products or particular individuals who at a moment move some part of the ball forward, but it takes everybody and what everybody is doing to actually create something that changes the world that D&D &D did. Mm -hmm. I guess sort of my, my, sort of my overwhelming thought reading this was just like how both Gygax and Arneson seem to have had just this really like self-destructive inability to just keep their mouth shut and just <laughs> like let something go. You know, it's it's like both of them just it just seems like they could never let anything go and and just had so much so much bad judgment about what should be aired publicly and what should be kept to yourself. They 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 were both I think self-destructive in that way. Um I mean, I think Arneson you know, he had a, a strong anti-authoritarian streak. He hated people telling him what to do. He definitely thought that he had the best judgment and he should be in charge, which makes for a great D&D &D referee, by the way. So these are qualities <laughs> you entirely want from your dungeon master. Um, 
but uh, especially for classic, for classic D and D, not maybe not for story gaming, but like you know that does not serve you well ultimately if you need to be able to work with other people to get stuff into shape for publication, and that that was true for for Arneson. And I mean, for Gygax, I mean, again, he, you know, he he kind of this this role of being president of TSR was foisted on him by a, a very sad thing, right? That his his childhood friend Don K died, and you know, he kind of ended ended up having to run the company. But once once the company was successful, he kind of felt like it was his obligation to keep doing it, right? Even though he, as far as I can tell, he really didn't like doing it. He certainly didn't like the day to day of running a business. And yet he wasn't willing to relinquish that either. And um, as you pointed out, he he did just spoil for fights. I mean, this this whole feud between Gen Con and Origins, uh, you know, after the Origins convention kind of emerged to challenge the dominance of Gary's uh, brainchild uh, Gen Con, you know, that the vitriol with which he fought that I mean, he really took it, you know, he approached it much the way that one approaches trash talking, like on, you know, <laughs> your, your team chat, like in Overwatch, right? <laughs> it's, um, yeah, it, it, they're, 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 they, they certainly had a lot of challenges, but I mean, I always want to t- take a step back as well and say, they did make this game happen. They did give this to us. It did spark all the cultural things that we love. And, you know, the, this book doesn't talk about that that much. Um, it's not something to lose sight of either. Yeah, well, I, I couldn't help it because Gary had he would often publish these columns in uh, Dragon Magazine that he used as sort of his personal soapbox, and a lot of the the targets were like you said, like yeah, he he said that fanzines are generally beneath contempt, uh, for they typify the lowest form of vanity press. Apparently, he used one column, or he at least in one column, he went after some sixteen year old who had printed out a fanzine on a, in his high school print shop. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And then there's this whole thing. After this is after Arneson leaves TSR, um, but Guy Gax in one of his games he creates a character called Nos Nos. I'm not, I'm not sure, perhaps Nasenra, this, Nasenra, I don't know. Yeah, which Nasenra is basically maybe. like Arneson backwards. Uh, yeah, and that's that's this, the Hill Giant Chief, right? That's the from the setting of the Hill Giant Chief from G1. He's like the main antagonist, um, and he ran this in tournaments, right? Like that summer, the summer of 1978 where, you know, he was leading people to kill Nasenra. <laughs> like how, yeah, that, that's pretty hardcore. <laughs> and this is, he describes this Nasenra as a grossly fat and thoroughly despicable creature, sly and vicious, loving ambush and backstabbing. And then when Arneson, in his first fantasy campaign, he has a character called The Egg, and EGG is Gary Gygax's initials. And the game says, all close servants of the egg undergo rigorous mental conditioning that is aimed at crushing all their mental initiative. The egg is known to hold an unshakable grudge against anything that has ever in any way caused it difficulty. Yeah. So, I mean, the egg actually existed before uh, D&D came out. This is like part of Blackmore, the Blackmore setting uh, pre-D&D. But honestly, you know... Arneson started using egg as hit the way he would talk about Gary in correspondence. And I think that that text is at least intended at this point, even if it's just repurposing kind of earlier ideas to reflect, well, like I said, Ar- Arneson's anti-authoritarian, um, you know, deep seated beliefs. He just, you know, that what he, you just described of how the egg like forces people to conform, um, you know, to do, to do his bidding and holds a grudge if they don't, uh, you know, that, that's pretty much the worst evil that Arneson could imagine. <laughs> um, but yeah, but it did seem like, yeah, that this, this, this battle between Gygax and Arneson, it was like the, this contest between like the boss from hell and the employee from hell. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I could go well, through some specifics, but how do you how do you feel about that characterization? I think they both thought that they should be the boss. Um, that's certainly true. I mean, you know, there's a big bit in the book about how there was a push at the end of 1976, right before Arneson left, you know, to expand the board of directors of TSR, right, from the two people that were there now, Gary Gygax and Brian, Brian Bloom, to four. That was really, you know, coming from Arneson and his friends from the Twin Cities. They they really thought that they should be running things. Um, they thought, and actually, they were hoping there would be a Twin Cities office of TSR, even. Uh, Arneson didn't seem to like Lake Geneva and, like, wanted to move. You know, he, he definitely had that, um, 
he didn't, he never, he just never wanted to work for the company. I mean, Gygax had to twist his arm to get him to agree to it. Uh, they had this huge fight over what employment contracts should look like. And, um, you know, Arneson was unwilling to commit to anything other than really having the most uh, right of first refusal sort of tangential um, relationship with TSR. That That's really what he preferred. He always wanted to be independent, a freelancer in charge of his own destiny. And that, that's not a good quality of an employee. Yeah, that's not what you're usually looking for for people you bring on on staff. Well, and it's, you can tell me if this is accurate or not, but I had the sense that, that Arneson did not ever put a huge amount of time into any of the Dungeons and Dragons books. Uh, you know, like he came up with, with some of these really important concepts and arguably the key concept, but then the amount of time he spent actually working on Dungeons and Dragons products seemed, you know, like it wasn't that much, and w- which made me you know, lose progressively lose sympathy for him as the book goes on. And he's saying that he deserves, you know, a million dollars. He should be in control of all this stuff. Like, uh, you know, he's not getting, uh, uh, what's the word, uh, compensated uh, adequately when he's, it seems like he was getting pre- compensated pretty well for relative to the amount of work that he, he did on the actual products. Yeah. And it's always difficult to separate out, you know, what work he did from what work he actually delivered. Right. And, you know, I think, you know, there, I think there's a perception and there may be some, some veracity to it that he actually did like a lot of stuff that like, you know, Gygax just didn't want to use. And like, you know, there, there may be some truth of that. There, you know, there are documents that survive that suggest some amount of work that was done. But I mean, part of this too, and you see this in the quotes I have from their correspondence, even in 1973, you know, the things that Arneson was delivering, they were all kind of like one-offs that were not really intended to like mesh with the rules that in the direction that Gary wanted to take them. And because Gary like had the company and Gary had like control of the manuscript, you know, sending him stuff that didn't mesh with the system in the direction that Gary wanted to send it only just made Gary mad, right? It wasn't going to end up in the book and, you know, just frustrated him. And so I think even in the places where he was pushing hard and trying to get material into it, um, you know, that that wasn't going to work. And then I do think he had just other interests. He was much more interested in historical miniatures in some ways than he was in, in the dungeon ad- adventure concept. And this is something I've been saying, certainly since playing at the world, that I think there's a lot of uh, places where Arneson kind of goes on record about his his interests in that and kind of, you know, his his lack of um, enthusiasm, especially for the kind of dungeon adventuring where there's a referee who runs a campaign for players who are collaborating rather than a referee who is running something for players who are competing. He, he kind of found the latter approach to be uh, just, just better to lead to a better game. And, you know, if, if you're kind of that misaligned with the direction that Gary is trying to take the game, um, you know, you, you can see why not a lot of his ideas, you know, especially after the original game was published, ended up making it to fruition in D&D. Yeah. So talk about this, this thing that happens at Origins 1978, where Arneson, he kind of has a Kanye West moment. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to let you finish, but <laughs> no, I th- at least Kanye didn't keep the, the, the trophy, right? <laughs> like, so yeah, I mean, th- this is um, now the battle between Guy X and Arneson is in full swing and Origins had created this award category they called the H.G. Wells Awards. Uh, Origins was traditionally like a board war game convention where people would play Avalon Hill games and SPI games and TSR would go and run tournaments. They ran the Tomb of Horrors <laughs> at, the, at the first one. So, but they were kind of like outsiders that was out, you know, it wasn't what Avalon Hill was interested in promoting anyway. Um, But when they developed this new award category, it was intended to honor things in the miniature space. And from Avalon Hill's perspective, uh, D&D was a miniatures game. It wasn't a board war game, so it must be miniatures. Those are are the categories they have to choose from. And there were three awards that were given to D&D. Um, including the award for, you know, best all time role playing game rules. And, you know, t- this, there's an award ceremony, right? It's not a huge one, but TSR employees would go up and get their trophy and thank people and so on and sit back down. And Arneson actually like ran up on stage to grab that all time greatest role playing game rules, uh, trophy. And like then, um, there was a bit of a dispute. Because, you know, should these trophies go to the company that published the game or should they go to the designer? And uh, Arneson had to run this whole publicity campaign to try to convince people that awards like this should go to designers and not not to companies. 
And, um, you know, we'll leave aside for the moment whether Arneson was the sole designer of D&D, which is, um, you know, kind of part of the discussion of that as well. But um, ultimately, there wasn't a lot of sympathy, even among the war game publishers in the industry for his position. And uh, he, he did not end up getting uh, all three trophies for himself. <laughs> but it seems like the industry kind of rallied around him overall because because Guy Gax had just alienated so many people that that Arneson kind of became the the standard bearer for all the animosity that, that Guy Gax had uh, engendered. Yeah, I mean, D&D at that point so dominated the industry. This was by the early 1980s um, that, I mean, any company that wanted to compete with TSR kind of found in Arneson's martyrdom um, a narrative that was commercially useful. Uh, whatever truth or falsity we ascribe to it, right? I mean, it was a commercially useful idea that TSR was a bad company, that D&D was acting in bad faith. If you want to publish a competing role-playing game, that's, that's a narrative that it's helpful for you to like latch onto. And th there's certainly a certain amount of that that, that is kind of cynical, um, bluntly, that, that was going around in the early 1980s. And, you know, when, or, you know, when Gary Gygax declared a boycott of the origins convention because he felt that it was acting against the interests of TSR and D&D. You know, we shouldn't be surprised if next year the origins gives a special award declaring Dave Arneson to be the father <laughs> of role-playing games, right? Like, and people, there's commentary in the fanzines even about this, that Guy Gax could hardly expect to be given an award from an organization that he declared war against. So do you th is your sense like if um, Gygax and Arneson had been less had spent less time feuding and it just been sort of more easygoing and cooperated cooperating with people in the industry and everything would would anything have transpired differently in terms of TSR or was was everything that happened kind of inevitable anyway? Uh, I mean, there's so many counterfactuals to consider in this narrative. Um, I mean, you know, if, if they if Arneson had never left the company. And if they had worked together on future products, obviously that would have had significant implications, right, for the way that this this uh, would have played out. But that just wasn't going to work. I mean, Arneson just didn't want to be there, didn't like taking orders, didn't like his work assignments. Um, I mean, I think we could have seen it coming, even from the things in the earlier chapters of the book before he joins TSR, that this was not going to be a harmonious period of his life <laughs> once once he went to work there. Um but, you know, I, I mean, of those counterfactuals, you know, my my favorite personally is, you know, what if James Dallas Egbert III had been into Tunnels and Trolls instead of D&D? &D? Like, what would have happened then? If, if, if lightning hadn't struck, like, all of these different places, they're just all these contingent events that were just, just show the randomness of history, right? Or the things that ended up having the biggest impact on the story. Yeah, I mean, maybe we should just explain. So, so James Dallas Egbert was this uh, college student who went missing, and 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 rumors got going by this weird self-promoting um, uh, private detective that the Dungeons and Dragons was involved, and it, it it turned out it wasn't, but it 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 caused all sorts of media outlets to 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 run with the story that there was this weird sadomasochistic cult called Dungeons and Dragons, and yeah. uh, you know, and and that's kind of what. Um, catapulted it into, into the stratosphere of, uh, of of publicity not 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 all good <laughs> but not uh, all lots good of publicity but this is the greatest example of you know there's no such thing as bad PR um, yeah. just in terms of the the sheer sales that resulted from it um, it, it transformed the hobby games industry like overnight um, there just hadn't been something that had gotten that close to the mainstream before now it, it did though have this this kind of long tail of repercussions. Um, you know, a patricial pulling, the satanic panic, uh, bothered about Dungeons and Dragons, these these uh, groups that emerged that were very critical and, and uh, aligned with religious fundamentalists. So Pat Robertson is getting involved. And there's, you know, just this, this constant narrative that the game was harmful that ultimately did, I think, help drag it down at the very end in the sense of when in 1985, uh, TSR was on the precipice, right? Where they, they really, um, it was unclear if they're going to be able to stay in business. That's when 60 Minutes is airing this interview with Patricia Poling and Gary Gygax talking about how this game is killing children. Um, 
which, you know, uh, Patricia Pulling believed at least that she had a lot of evidence uh, to support that, whether we want to take that seriously is a, another matter. Well, let me read this quote. You say, Radecki, this is a, well, this is, I mean, this is so, uh, I mean, the, the media just is was so bad in this whole thing. But yeah, in this 60 Minutes report, they introduced this guy, Thomas Radecki, as a, quote, scientist who teaches at the University of Illinois Medical School, which it turns out was basically not true. <laughs> uh, so they hadn't really checked that, it seems like. But anyway, but but they also, but you say, Radecki also related with a straight face and accounts of parents who witnessed their child, quote, summon a Dungeons and Dragons demon into his room before he killed himself. And this is this apparently didn't give 60 minutes pause about whether this guy was a, a reliable yeah. source or. Yeah. Well, you never know, right? Uh, you, could, <laughs> you know, look, there are these demons out there, uh, if we're to understand. And th th this is just, again, part of this, um, the excitability of people. You know, this is like Shakespeare, man is a giddy thing. I mean, once people get these notions to their heads and they, um, you know, whether it, Ed Bradley made the right decision in giving that guy uh, the, the megaphone of the media is, is very unclear. But he, of course, uh, Radecki went on to be a big campaigner against video game violence, against, you know, Grand Theft Auto and, and things like that. And uh, people can Google him. He has his own uh, colorful um, end story. <laughs> Okay, yeah, I don't know. I'll have to, I'll have to look into that. But, um, and, but it does seem though that the biggest problem TSR had was just that they were spending twice as much money as they were making. And it seems like even without the satanic panic and even without this feud between Gygax and Artisan, that that would have killed the company just all by itself. Sure. I mean, it just you know it came that sixty minutes piece came out at a time when the bank was trying to figure out if Gygax could be a responsible steward for this company going forward, right? So at the moment of his ouster, right, really right before that is when that 60 Minutes piece aired. And if you were somebody who was trying to figure out if you're going to loan more money to this company and you see that piece, um, I don't think it's going to like make you more confident in the company's prospects. Sure, but you don't think they just had a fundamental problem? Oh, oh they did. Oh, yeah, spending. yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and this this was mostly staff overhead, right? This was just they had so many people on staff and because of that, so much equipment and so many cars and like all the things that come with having, uh, you know, that huge uh, an organization. Though, of course, you know, at the time that they hired all those people, they really seemed to believe that they were going to have consistent year over year doubling of D&D &D revenue and of games revenue and in the diversification into publishing. And that, you know, they were going to be a company making $280 million a year in, you know, four or five years. And this is at a time they were making, you know, $22 million a year that they, they thought that. And, you know, if you believe that, you can understand why you want to hire up why you want to bring all these people on staff. It's just by the time they realized the game was not going to grow the way they thought, um, they had to be borrowing from the bank just to meet payroll and they'd run up so much debt. And the process of just, you know, laying people off is also expensive, right? There's like severance, there's like all these things that go into that. Um, you know, there was no good way out of this other than um, real belt tightening. And, and by the end, you know, salary deferments, um, you know, measures that would have been unthinkable, like two years before when they believed they were going to be the next Parker Brothers. Well, but also, I mean, like, you know, you, you say Gary Gygax in, in Hollywood was renting this, you know, this apartment building or something, some sort of uh, some sort of housing, that, you know, like the, that. the King Vidor Ranch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and I worked it out. It works out to thirty thousand dollars a month rent adjusted for inflation. Um, and there yeah. was this uh, one of these executives was um, like regularly taking golfing trips with a distributor or something to Florida, you know. The, right. <laughs> um, and it just seems like even even aside from the uh, hiring too many people, they were just hemorrhaging money in all sorts of ridiculous ways. Well, all these diversification ventures that didn't work, you know, they spent a lot of money trying to do video games that didn't work. Obviously, they spent a ton of money on screenplays for Hollywood that didn't work. Um, you know, they tried to build their own miniatures business. You know, they had pretty much the same idea that Warhammer did earlier. And if they just managed to, like, execute it well, you know, they could have been like Warhammer, right? <laughs> but, um, you know, they decided they weren't going to be successful on that and they cut that. And yeah, any of these diversification ventures 
if they prove unsuccessful, you take write-offs for them, right? Those become accounting charges. And a lot of the negative profits you see from TSR are just from things they, they had to write off in 1983, 84, and 85. Mm -hmm. But so so my understanding going into this book was I always thought of Lorraine Williams as the villain of this story who, you know, took, you know, outmaneuvered Gary Gygax and she wasn't a gamer and she took over the company and, you know, that was wrong. And if if he had stayed there, maybe things would have been better. And like reading all the details in this book, it gets to the point where she does that. I'm kind of like, I really can't, I really don't blame her. Like at this point, like it's really, it's really not good. Uh, I, I can see why I can sort of sympathize with her wanting to to get rid of him by that point. I mean, I, I do sympathize with everyone, right? I mean, I, 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 you know, when we were talking about it being negative earlier, I mean, everyone made mistakes and, you know, everyone had their, their egos and everything else. But I mean, I think they were trying to make the best of a situation nobody expected they'd be in. Suddenly they're in it. And like, what are they going to do, right? <laughs> and so I, I hope no one comes across in this as a villain, right? I mean, um almost no one and william deer maybe maybe comes across yeah. the, the the private detective uh and the, the egbert thing there's a, maybe a handful of people that um i think come come across like they're acting very much in bad faith i don't, I don't really think the blooms or gygax or Ernestin were really acting so much in bad faith as in trying to figure out how to take this thing and make it into what they wanted it to be and i i put lorraine in the same category yeah, well, I mean, however people come across in this book, I mean, there's almost no editorializing in this book at all. It's all just like this person, yeah. here's this deal that happened. Here's what this person said in this letter or like whatever. So, you know, it, it's not like you, you're pushing any agenda in this book. It's just a very straight recitation of the facts and people can make up their own minds about how they feel about all the characters. Yeah, I mean, and there's plenty of things that, like I said at the start, you know, I can't figure out. I mean, I, I've been studying this, this for years. I can't even tell you if Dave Arneson quit TSR was fired, right? There's like this huge dispute over this because it's really unclear given, you know, uh, exactly how that played out, whether we should say, and this, this had to go to like a labor board dispute when Arneson was trying to apply for unemployment, um, where TSR was having the opinion, no, he, he quit. And Arneson said, no, I was fired. And like exactly how that went, I'm, I'm not sure I really know. Yeah. I mean, there's one point in the book where Gygax is talking about how playing role-playing games makes you good at business because of all these skills of logic and planning and negotiation and everything. And when I read that, I was like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Like, I could see that. You know, it seems like those are some transferable skills. But then you look at what happens, you know, <laughs> in the next couple of years in terms of him running this business and what happens. And then you're like, oh, well, I don't know. Uh, so I, I think, what it, do you it think it works it? great in the hobby scale. It works, you know, get, Gygax was great in person. Like everybody who met him before he became Gary Gygax and everyone had all this anger over the success of D&D, &D, you know, just remarked on how eager he was to help how he wanted to sit down and like play games with you and like help you design games help you perfect your own rules and you know, he's a really gregarious outgoing friendly guy and like as as long as it remained that personal as long as it kind of remained i'm a hobbyist in this hobby community and i'm kind of helping us all get you know in this direction uh, he was great it's just once those skills started to have to be applied to running a medium-sized business where now there's like a lot of people on staff, there's many layers of management, there's process and this group needs to agree with this group and they need to go execute on this general strategy and you you can't micromanage everything. As soon as it became that kind of company, I mean, he just, he hated it, right? And he just, he wanted out, he couldn't bring himself to sever himself from it. But, um, you know, it, it, you know, it wasn't just a matter that, um, of his competencies, I think he just would rather have been doing other things. And so he focused his attention elsewhere. Right. And they were really kind of stuck, it seems like, because you had, you know, Gygax and the Blooms who were like gamers. They didn't really have any business experience to speak of. And then, you know, so they, they keep trying to bring in these guys. And it's like, oh, this guy is like the assistant vice counsel to Schlitz Beer. He'll be good. You know, and it's like, uh, <laughs> you know, there there weren't really like people who, it seems anyway, like game executives, you know, so it's, it's sort of like you can either have a gamer or someone who has business experience in a completely unrelated field and, and neither really would do the trick. Yeah, I think that the, um, the book actually starts with a quote from Dickens from Little Dorrit, you know, that, that no inventor can be a man of business, you know, 
And um, that's that's the, the epigraph of the book. Um, certainly, it is really hard to find people that have the, both of those competencies, right? You you look to like a Jobs or someone, right? Like as someone who really seems to have had this this incredible um, design and vision and so on, and also could most of the time run a business, not always, but by, by the end, he'd certainly, I think, gotten it down pat. Um, it's it's a competency that's very difficult to develop. I mean, we, we see a lot of stories in Game Wizards of people who made money, but really didn't have any idea how to like keep money or wield money, right? <laughs> because they just, you know, they just didn't have the training to do it. And TSR desperately tried to get um, its managers into kind of, um, you know, uh, training programs or, you know, please go get an MBA or whatever. And uh, those those ventures didn't really have enough behind them to turn around the situation of the company. Yeah. All right. So let me ask you about this. So, so, so on page 156, it says Gene Wells came on board at around the same time as Gygax put it, quote, to give the game material a feminine viewpoint. And then on page 179, Gene Wells was sidelined around this time due to an incident involving the module Palace of the Silver Princess, which was notoriously pulped due to objectionable content. And it just seems like I would not have uh, uh, suspected or expected the feminine viewpoint hire to be involved in the objectionable content uh, issue. So is there like what's the story behind that? Yeah, and this has some nuance to it. Um, so the objectionable content was mostly illustrations that were in the book, right? There's this one, it's called the, the illusion of Decapus. And there, there's another, which, which basically shows a woman in a, 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 a charged situation. And then there's another that was done by Aerolotus, um, that seems to have caricatures of TSR staffers, um, and executives in it. And like, so th those illustrations had a lot to do with it. But at the same time, I think people felt that just from a content perspective, it wasn't consistent with what they were, the line they were trying to create for the basic modules, right? This is In Search of the Unknown, uh, Keep of the Borderlands, and this is following that, Palace of the Silver Princess. Um, so, you know, the, and this, of course, has become one of the most storied collectibles in the history of D&D because it, they, it was demanded that they pulp these copies of uh, the orange cover, Palace of the Silver Princess. Some survived. If you want one now, be prepared to pay five figures, right, for a copy of it that's in decent shape. So, But, but so was Jean Wells kind of like responsible for that or what, did she like take the fall when it was someone else's like screw up or... I mean, it depends on how much you think the issue was the pictures versus the alignment of the content with, um, you know, what they wanted for the B series. And depending on who you ask within TSR, you'll hear, hear different stories about that. This isn't the kind of thing that leaves a solid evidentiary paper trail where people say, this is the reason why we pulped it, right? <laughs> like, um, <laughs> so, I mean, it, it, it's a little, there's a little bit of a, he said, she said to it. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure I would say which one of them is the cause. Uh -huh. I mean, because uh, another thing I want to ask you about is, you know, there was so there was this book called Deities and Demigods. And, you know, it has like real world gods from different pantheon, you know, from real religions around the world. And you say that this was kind of a strange move for a, a company that's trying to um, escape the impression that there's something uh, suspect or, you know, when they're under fire from all these religious groups and things. And as a kid, when I would see all these these Dungeons and Dragons books, I always just assumed that they were being intentionally provocative, you know, like mm. like Ozzy Osbourne or something like that. Um, but reading this book, it makes it seem like it was more just kind of like perpetual chaos and that this stuff wasn't really intentional or thought out a lot of the time. But what's your take on that? I don't think they were trying to be provocative, you know, in, in response to bother about Dungeons and Dragons and kind of the more general um, satanic panic attention that was applied to D&D. You know, they did form this, this, these RPR groups is what they called them internally, religious persecution response groups. And they had a whole bunch of these committees. By this point, TSR was the kind of company that just had like a lot of committees that would produce reports and then senior management would act on them or not. When you, when you kind of go through that material, you do see a bit of it. You do see a bit of that provocation. You see people saying things like, you know, yes, the reason there, there's all this like gnashing of teeth about the occult, but the reason that people find the occult compelling is because there might just maybe there's something to it. 
And like, I don't think they meant anything more than about than that um, about that than they do say about astrology, right? Or um, you know, when you read your horoscope in the newspaper, is there something to it? Well, pr- probably not, right? But there, there was just this background level. Um, especially coming out of the 1970s of crystals and new ageism and this kind of American watered down spiritualism. And I think they, they did want to tap that a bit, or at least they were certainly aware that that was part of the market that was out there. But, you know, Guy Gax and Ernest, and they identify as Christians, right? I mean, they strongly. And so as a consequence of that, it, um, I don't really think that they were trying to, um, you know, really take some more provocative stand about the possible veracity of occultism. (laughs) Hmm. Um, You mentioned that there was this, um, I think you mentioned there was this screenplay by James Goldman, an Oscar winning screenwriter behind The Lion in Winter that never got produced. Uh, Is is that screenplay still around? Like, is there any way to do you have any idea what it was about or anything like that? I do. Actually, I wrote an article about this a few years ago um, that's on The Escapist. Uh, you could, I'll, I can send you the link and you can put it into the show notes if you want. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I have read it. I've studied it. It's really bad. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I think if that came out, people would not have been happy about that as a D&D movie. I mean, it's basically Is a story it just because of- he, he didn't get Dungeons and Dragons, basically? Like he was a good screenwriter but just wasn't a gamer or yeah i mean i think it was far too focused on a kid's market um and it, you know the the dnd cartoon which came out a year after this screenplay was developed it actually has some things in common with it in that it's about a bunch of teenagers who are transported into this realm of dnd and there's kind of an adventure they go on but unlike the D&D cartoon, the characters really don't have a lot of agency. They don't do much. They're more kind of spectators. Anytime they really get in problems, they get rescued by someone else. Like nobody casts spells. Nobody really kills, you know, swings to kill things, right? It's it's really, um, I don't know how to describe it, but, but pro- probably I'd say it was written like maybe we could get a G rating for this. Because Gygax is really talking it up. Do you, so, so was he, did he not realize it wasn't good or do you think he was just trying to hype it up or, or what? I think he really hoped it would be good. Maybe he thought that, you know, the draft and I've only, you know, I've seen a draft of this for all I know, there were eight more drafts, right. That we haven't found yet. And one of them's amazing, but um, I think he just knew what he wanted out of it. And he knew that if he was paying for the screenplay himself, he'd be able to get what he wanted. I don't think they were anywhere near it anyway from uh, the version of the the screenplay that I saw. Huh. Yeah, Cause I'm a, I was a big fan of that cart. I loved that cartoon when I was a kid. So, uh, you know, if they ever make a movie out of that, I would, I'd go see that. Uh, you know, every once in a while, I hear rumors that somebody might try to bring that back in some form. Um, I'm sure it would do so well. It's just one of those retro properties of the kind that if you brought them back now, you know, people would eat it up. So somebody should do it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, so in the book, uh, in the back of the book, you say, finally, I'd like to thank Mike Whitwer for thoughts on the work in progress. So what kind of, uh, what were some of his thoughts on this book as you were working on it? I mean, so uh, Mike and I obviously have collaborated for many years now. We worked on D&D Art and Arcana and Heroes Feast. Um, You know, Mike was one of the people I really wanted to read it, in part because, you know, so I, I don't write for a popular audience, right? So this is a book being put out by MIT Press. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff that I write outside of work like Art and Arcana is really intended for um, people that are pretty serious and scholarly about these games. So really, I was looking for Mike to help me um, understand how I can explain this in a slightly less onerously scholarly style than I usually do. <laughs> and he, he was very helpful with that. And also, you know, as, as for fact checking, like just there are simple things that, you know, I'll always get wrong when I'm writing these things and anything that does remain in there, it's my fault, not anybody else's, but, you know, he at least spotted uh, some of the errors that I made in that as did my good friend, Bill Meinhard, um, as who is, you know, the great collector of uh, D&D and fantasy role-playing game material, um, Mark Greenberg. It was my privilege to work with Mike Carr, who is a character in the book. 
um, in the sense, you know, he was a senior manager at TSR from 1976 up to 83. This is the guy who edited the player's handbook originally, right? He wrote In Search of the Unknown, B1. So um, someone who really had that insider view of the company during the crucial period I write about. Um, it was fantastic to work with him on this as well. So uh, like, like D&D itself, it takes a village to make something like this. It's certainly just not all me. Well, that's funny that you talk about the book being scholarly. I mean, I really found it very engaging and I, I thought it was really well written. I had to like, there were lines, like I wanted to mention one where you say, the presidency of TSR now resembled the more turbulent periods in the annals of Imperial Rome, where a succession of fleeting emperors proved insufficiently wary of the next usurper. There's just like <laughs> sort of right. There's a lot of wry humor in the book that I like, like that, that I really appreciated. I mean, there is some other stuff too, which is you'd never notice because it's all just, you know, citations of fanzines and 17th century war games. And, you know, like... <laughs> uh, and then also uh, there was this video on YouTube I saw where it's you and this guy, Ben Riggs, talking about mm -hmm. how you don't have a uh, a huge um, uh, rivalry over uh, over your D&D &D books. Could you talk about that? Yeah, so so Ben uh, Ben Riggs is putting out a book that will come out next year that's called Slaying the Dragon. And it actually is focused mostly, not exclusively, but mostly on the period after Game Wizards ends. And so he was kind of looking, you know, he hadn't seen Game Wizards when he started writing this, but, you know, the period that my previous ambush at Sheridan Springs kind of, kind of wraps up, um, you know, he wanted to write about, okay, what happened to TSR during the Lorraine Williams era? How did it end up being in the position where it was ultimately acquired by Wizards of the Coast in the late 1990s? And I thought that sounded really cool. And so I worked with Ben a bit. Um, I mean, he, he's been, of course, working with all of the TSR staff. Um, a lot of people have been giving him good interviews and sources. I, I threw a little bit on the top of that of sources from um, that later period. But he also has a section in the beginning of this book where he talks about, you know, kind of the pricey history of what happened up to the point when the rain took over. And so, uh, you know, I, I certainly have uh, uh, tried to give him the best advice I can about that and about things to cover for that. But the main point of that video was just as soon as uh, Game Wizards was announced, a lot of people who follow Ben were uh, they knew about his book and it was coming like, oh, my God, you know, so, is somebody trying to beat you to the punch is like Peterson <laughs> sneaking this in before you. And so we did that video at Gen Con this year just to say, actually we're buds we have known that we're both been doing these books forever and like we've been coordinating about this to make sure that they're going to be on the same page this isn't going to be something where you're going to be asking is riggs right or is peterson right hopefully we have aligned these pretty much as well as we can yeah that's that's really exciting to me and i'm definitely looking forward to that book because that that lorraine williams era at tsr the the sort of second edition all that stuff that's what really what i grew up with you know like mm -hmm. my first player's handbook was the second edition handbook and all the you know, R.A. Salvatore and Dark Sun and, and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to, to continuing the story. Yeah, I mean, I, I really, the main D&D &D that I did in the 90s is all 2E D&D. &D. Um, heavily hacked second edition D&D. &D. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right, so we're pretty much out of time. Do you have any other final thoughts or like what are you, what's your next, do you have any more D&D &D books coming or, or what are you up to now? Oh, I have a ton of stuff coming. I, I don't think I'm allowed to talk about any of it yet, but you, you know, um, more projects that are kind of along the lines of Art and Arcana and Heroes Feast are in the works at various stages of, of development. And of course, uh, I've got my own scholarly interests. I, I hope I'm mostly done with writing about the early days of D&D at this point. <laughs> um, I, I think I've looked at that through so many different lenses and angles, but uh, there are other things about gaming history that I'm super interested in. And so uh, I'll keep working on it as long as people keep telling me that it's it's worth doing. So, uh, And I guess I'll just explain for listeners that Art and Arcana is a D&D art book and Heroes Feast is a D&D &D cookbook. So so you're saying something, some more things kind of in that general avenue are, are on the way? Yeah. So we, we, we work with uh, Ten Speed Press is the company that published both of those um, as a licensee from Wizards of the Coast. And so uh, Heroes Feast did, did quite well, actually. Uh, it was on the New York Times bestseller list for, for um, several weeks, I gather. And, you know, Art Narcana got a, uh, a Hugo Award no nomination, right? So, I mean, they, these, these reach a much wider audience than my more scholarly work, right, generally does. And so, yeah, I mean, I would just say, of course, 
uh, we're, we're hopeful there's going to be more projects like that um, that are more on the popular side that people get to read and uh, and then more gritty scholarly stuff will come out <laughs> as it comes out. <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to those. Really definitely looking forward to reading my, what, seventh, eighth, and ninth books about the history of Dungeons and Dragons. So. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Well, again, th thanks so much for having me. I don't think I have anything more on this, but um, it's always a pleasure for me to join you here on Geek's Guide. And, um, you know, I, I appreciate the uh, the amplification. Yeah, yeah. So let's uh, wrap things up there. So we've been speaking with John Peterson about his new book, Game Wizards. So, John, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, David. And that was our interview. So big thanks again to John Peterson for joining us on the show. And remember that Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please support us on Patreon over at patreon.com slash geeks or via PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. All right, so that was our show. So thanks everyone for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkirtley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.